Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Grey Malkin Lane, the podcast where queer friends gather to review and discuss the original X-Men comics from the 1960s. I'm your host, Chad Anderson. Last week, we reviewed X-Men number 19, which is very Shakespeareanly called uh, Lo, Now Shall Appear the Mimic, uh, the issue where Stan Lee works last as a writer, at least in the original continuity. Uh, in it, the X-Men met Calvin Rankin, a mutant named the Mimic, and he is a mutant. We double-checked. He was not a mutant for a long time, but in the most recent continuity, he is a mutant. Uh, and he can copy all of their powers, uh, but they ultimately defeated him when he tried to manipulate the team into gaining ultimate power. Uh, today, we're going to review X-Men number 20 uh, called I, Lucifer, uh, from May 1966. Uh, so I'm super thrilled to be joined by my regular co-host, Heather. Hello, Heather. Uh, as well as uh, two new guests. Uh, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. And uh, if you'll use your uh, gender pronouns, and then the question I have for everyone today is, what is your favorite creative team uh, in X-Men history. It can be from the X-Men books or any of the side books. If you have more than one, uh, that is okay. But uh, Anthony, let's start with you. Oh, uh, hello, I'm Anthony Oliveira. Uh, any pronoun is fine. Ooh, my favorite creative team is tough. Um, I mean, I live for like a Chris Claremont, Paul Smith moment. I think that that is a real kind of weirdly underrated run um, in terms of like everyone always Claremont gets paired with a lot of other artists before you think of Smith, but I love that that section of art. Um, the Morrison Quietly era is like such a shift. I remember reacting very negatively the first time I saw that art, and it's like now it's like one of my favorite moments in X history. And maybe the more obscure choice would be Marjorie Lou Gabriel Walta on Astonishing, the particularly the Iceman arc there. I think is a real again like an art style I didn't get when I was first looking at it and now I can't stop looking at it so those are maybe my top three for now <laughs> beautiful choices there's so many to choose from uh Heather my name is Heather and I use she her pronouns um because I'm a little baby x-men fan um my I'm only really familiar with Stan and Jack as a team so I would probably have to go with them it's until today and now <laughs> now you've got choices it's always uh, good to have options <laughs> expanding our horizons uh and then yeah. daryl go ahead hi i'm daryl i you use he his and i think my favorite right now is claremont cockram just because they're so seminal they did so much for the x line um but if i want to give another shout out to a writer it's Louise Simonson because I feel that she had a really good handle on writing characters and really taking ownership of them so I sort of like the empathy that she injected into her own writing beautiful uh and I'm Chad I use he him as well if I had to pick one uh I I am gonna choose uh Rick Remender and Jerome Pena's uh run on Uncanny X-Force just as a as a full series, it's uh, it's just so beautifully orchestrated front to back. Uh, but I have a lot of favorites over the years, and a lot that I don't love too. So we <laughs> we'll save that conversation for another time. So the reason we're asking that question today, uh, and we've been building to this in the podcast for a while, but in X Men number twenty, Stan Lee takes over as the editor of the book. He's been writing everything across Marvel, basically. Uh, kind of from the start for a long time, but Roy Thomas is going to take over. So Roy Thomas is still alive. He's 80. Uh, I just learned that today. So in doing my research, and he's pretty famous for doing uh, uh, Conan the Barbarian. Uh, he had a long run on the X-Men. He, he has this run, uh, Heather, for your information. He's the writer for the rest of the original run. So issue 20 all the way to issue 66. Uh, for So for five years, he's long-term writer on the Avengers as well. Uh, he worked on the Justice Society of America for DC really famously. And he is the co-creator of many of our very favorite characters, uh, Wolverine and Vision and Ultron and Carol Danvers and Luke Cage and Iron Fist and Ghost Rider and the Squadron Supreme. I mean, I could go on and on. He's created so many classic characters that have been around in Marvel since almost the beginning. Uh, the artist here we've seen in some previous issues of the X-Men, he goes by Jay Gavin. His real name is Werner Roth. Uh, Werner Roth uh, chose the pen name Jay Gavin, I believe named after his sons, 
because he was also working at DC and I don't think he wanted to be caught. <laughs> so, so he was Werner Roth in DC and Jay Gavin at Marvel. Uh, he, uh, he did a lot of work primarily on a very obscure character named uh, Lorna the Jungle Girl, uh, which is kind of a, 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 an old comic from the 50s. Uh, and he died in 1973 at the age of 52. So he's been gone a long time. Um, so we are, uh, we are here uh, joined by, we had Terry Blast back on issue number 10, episode number 10. We are joined by Anthony Oliveira today, who is a Marvel creator. Uh, Marvel, um, Marvel is a new-ish venture for you, Anthony, but tell us a little bit about some of the work you've done uh, for the company so far. Yeah, uh, pretty new, last few years. Um, I My first Marvel work was a backup for uh, the War of the Realms crossover, which was um, kind of a, among other things, kind of another heel turn for Loki. Uh, so I wanted to look back on his more face moment as Kid Loki in uh, The Young Avengers. So it was called My Drag Brunch with Loki, um, in which <laughs> it was a Wiccan and Hulkling story in which uh, Wiccan and Loki sat down, and sort of talked about the stakes of forgiveness. Um, and that has kind of led into a series of Wiccan and Hulkling stories I've done. I did the Emperor Hulkling cross um, the one shot for the Empire book, where we kind of pivoted Hulkling off the couch and into kind of the center of the Marvel universe as sort of the, the heir apparent to two galactic empires, the Kree and the Skrull. Um, and then uh, most recently I did a uh, uh, the uh, Last Annihilation Wiccan and Hulkling one shot, which sort of flashed back to how those two boys first met. And maybe most germane to your podcast, I did a flashback to right around this period in uh, X-Men history um, in a story for the Marvel Pride anthology in which Magneto attacks the Academy uh, at a moment when Iceman is processing his crush on Angel um, and Magneto throws away his missiles to have a little chat about the stakes of the closet with a young Bobby Drake. Uh, so that, that's the work I've done thus far anyway. Um, so, so it's to, nice to be visiting the 60s again. I spent a lot of time making sure I didn't make any mistakes when I was writing that story. So it's, I'm happy the stakes are a little lower this time. <laughs> <laughs> to, pull in, uh, to pull in that scene from X-Men 14, you're, so your Marvel Pride issue, uh, you... You take a scene directly from X-Men number 14, which is right before they fight the Sentinels, in which Bobby is very affectionately helping Angel strap his wings down. And on the podcast multiple times, we've talked about uh, the idea of Angel strapping his wings down as a way of hiding or closeting the things that he should learn to be proud of. Although Angel's not queer, there's definitely a queer parallel there. But here we have the queer character helping him you know, learn how to hide uh, why did you choose that scene to build your story from? It was so beautifully done. Oh, thank you. And uh, Javier did an amazing job of, we literally redrew those three panels and then just kind of expanded the scene from there. Um, yeah, so it is fun to, in a weird way, collaborate, not just with like one of Marvel's best artists right now, but also Jack Kirby. Uh, <laughs> um, I... When they approached me about doing something for the Pride issue um, and we started zeroing in on Iceman, um, the thing that's always driven me crazy from a certain segment of so-called fans is the idea that Iceman being gay came out of nowhere when in fact <laughs> Iceman has been written as gay for a very, very long time. And it was simply that uh, for a long time, uh, writers couldn't say it, right? Like... Um, you basically since 1985, right? Like the the Iceman one shot, uh, the Iceman miniseries makes no sense unless you read it as a closet narrative. Similarly, uh, when Emma Frost takes over his body in the 90s and she sees some secret that is making him uh, not use his full potential and starts making interior decorating jokes at him. Like, um, and then into the Austin run with North Star and the Marjorie Lou run, which I already mentioned with Gabriel Walter, like there, there's been all these moments. There's a famous scene that I'm obsessed with during the onslaught crisis, who we might have occasion to talk about today, um, where Gene, Bobby is trying to come out to Jean in a Barnes and Noble, right? Like he's trying to tell her what it is the problem and he can't. Um, so when I was conceiving the story initially, I was like, what if we flashed back to all these moments where B Bobby almost came out? Um, 
and then of course it's only five pages long and I was like it might be strongest if we go back to the earliest one and I mean there's obviously Bobby's kind of gay even in X-Men number one right like when Gene shows up and all the boys are like, whoa, check out that girl. And he's like, I'm not a wolf like you guys. And his little boot exits frame. There's already <laughs> something kind of queer. In fact, his first appearance is sort of spinning down that um, pole, right? Like there's something kind of fruity about Bobby right from the jump. But there was something really tender about that scene in X-Men 14 to me, where he's, again, sort of helping Warren hide himself. And he's like, would it be that bad? Would it really be that bad if the world knew about us? Um and Angel's like, yeah, that would be the worst thing. Like, we have to hide. And how horrible that must be. And of course, Jack and um, uh, Stan immediately pivot away to another scene, right? Because one of the things that page is doing is showing the various ways the X-Men have to compromise themselves. We watch Beast putting on this fake shoe. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to linger on that moment. And the the seed of the story came out of that that beat of like, well... What does Bobby feel when someone tells him he has to hide himself? Which, of course, a kid in the 60s, like that, there weren't many more options than that. We're pre-Stonewall, even when this comic comes out. Um, so I just wanted to linger in that moment and give Bobby the pages he never gets, which are the, the moments in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, when the text can't say what's happening. Um, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to let the text keep saying the thing that it almost keeps saying that's you, where that story came from do you think that stanley intended for iceman to be gay uh stanley obviously criticism of stanley has been rampant for the last few years as a collaborator as kind of a glory hog but one thing i did always no i don't think I don't think it was even on his horizon of thinking about it but one of the things i've always admired about stanley is um there was a moment where someone told him about Bobby coming out in the comics and Stanley's response was, wow, I didn't know that. And I think that's such a beautiful, it speaks to what you have to do in comics, which especially superhero comics like this, where it's like, literally Bobby is older than me. Bobby will be well-known decades after I'm dead and dust, right? Like you recognize that sometimes the story you write says something you didn't realize you had written. Um, and someone else might pick up a baton you didn't expect them to pick up. And a good steward of these characters, which is what we are, we, they, we sort of, they pass through our hands and pass back out of them, recognizes that the story will move in ways you don't expect. I'm always disappointed in writers or uh, artists who, and we won't name names, they're not great at feet, but like, <laughs> who get really mad when a character becomes something they don't like and like Shatterstar is not gay. And as soon as I get back on that book, we're going to fix it. Right. Like that's a horrible way to behave with a text that you have sort of paid the entry fee to be like, listen, I'm going to tell my story while I can. And someday I have to get off the ride and someone else will take over. So Stan never thought so, but I think he had the presence of mind to recognize I mean, he, the, to the, the extent we will talk about in this episode, even like to the extent to which he understands the mechanisms of the mutant metaphor is interesting, right? Like yeah. how much does he really grasp the racial, sexual um, disability, especially in this week's uh, issue? How much does he understand what he's actually mobilizing when he talks about the mutant metaphor is an interesting question with Stan, I think. Absolutely. We, uh, we have an ongoing theory on Gray Malkin here that Beast is bisexual as well. There's so many scenes of him flirting openly, especially with Kesar. There's a there's a scene with him in the jungle where he's like, "Oh, your biceps!" as he grabs him. Uh, yeah, that fight. Like, I was listening to your episode where you're talking about the fight with Unis and like, yeah. okay, these shirtless boys are grappling. <laughs> yeah. We get we get more shirtless men wrestling in this issue, actually. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Heather uh, Scarlet Witch, I know, is one of your very favorites. She uh, she in the future has two children. It's complicated, yeah. but one of her kids is a magic boy whose name is Wiccan. Wiccan, yeah. Uh, and Wiccan is married to Hulkling, and so Anthony's also written some really prominent issues of Wiccan and Hulkling as a married gay couple in comics now as well, which is brilliant. Okay. We're preparing on Grey Malkin Lane in just a couple of episodes. Actually, I think it will come out before this episode, but we haven't recorded it yet. Uh, we're doing a trial of Wanda Maximoff. We did one of uh, Charles Xavier recently, but we're going to delve deep into uh, <laughs> Wanda Maximoff's history and talk a little bit about uh, her as a mother in that. Uh, so, so stay tuned to that. Although, again, when you listen, we likely will put that one out just before this one uh, because <laughs> of the, uh, the comic break. 
justice uh, for Wanda. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we're gonna see. We're gonna we're gonna see that the the podcast is largely going to be how responsible are we for uh or for what we do when we are mentally ill and or manipulated by others. That's largely mm-hmm. going to be what the content is, but it's gonna be uh a, a pretty interesting. What's it been like for you, Anthony? Uh, uh, final fangirling question here uh, to write <laughs> uh, to write these characters, Wiccan and Hulkling, as an out gay couple in Marvel comics. I think that. I get, well, first of all, obviously a tremendous honor, but also a tremendous responsibility, uh, especially the most comes. recent one. Yeah, with I don't know who said it. Someone said it, but with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> yeah. um, most particularly in the most recent issue, because when you tell the origin story for this love affair, you are prefaced by now 16 years of fanfic that has beaten you to it so <laughs> you I felt a certain responsibility first of all to kind of leave room for a lot of that fanfic like the text as told is a few scenes and hopefully a lot of scenes that others have written can still stand but also like you have to you have to give them more than that um fanfic is always kind of hidebound in that way it has to respect it can't innovate in a way, in, in some ways. I'm interested in fanfic as like a theoretical possibility. And in many ways, that's what I write, right? Like mine just has the imprimatur of the Marvel logo on it, but um, there is a kind of responsibility. <laughs> to, like, and like for this story in particular, I literally had to go back to the 60s material because there was a lot of like Captain Marvel, Nega Band stuff and Supreme Intelligence stuff and like, going back to the original um, Ditko and Stan Lee stuff for Dormammu and like, what does Dormammu sound like when he speaks? It's like an interesting thing to try to recapture. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of archive digging, which is actually one of my favorite things. I, I, before I started writing, I was a PhD student. So um, going back into the archive, like you guys do on this podcast, is one of my favorite things in the world. Um, it's fun and it's stressful and it's kind of a high wire act. Uh, and the rush is like nothing else. <laughs> Not, not the same thing, but I used to write for the Marvel handbooks from- uh, Oh, that's very stressful. 2006 to 2011. So yeah, it was like constant digging into the archives and tying everything together. It was a lot of work, but a lot of fun too. Oh man, I I feel for you. I, I was very frustrated when I was writing this because I caught a continuity error on a, all of the wikis had it wrong about the history of the Negabands. They were destroyed in the Negabomb. And yet every wiki was like, they were inherited by Genus Valence. Like, that's not what the page says. I was so frustrated. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, that's stressful, especially with superhero fans, right? Like, they mm-hmm. know their stuff. When you're writing the encyclopedia, you got to make sure you get it down. <laughs> exactly. uh, I love the contrast between the two stories we just discussed with you as the closeted teen that took decades to come out and then this couple who have come out as teens and embraced their life and married young uh what a what a different world I'm in my 40s now but I go back to you know 13 14 year old me reading comics to know of an out gay writer writing out gay characters uh what a different world we live in now uh Heather and uh, Daryl do either of you have questions for Anthony before we jump into issue 20 no I think I'm good Okay. I just want to say you did a wonderful job with the last Annihilation story. And oh, I thank you so much. He told my partner, you need to read this. Like, it is <laughs> so good, so touching. Like, in the middle of such a really impactful and dynamic storyline, you were able to make space to tell a really beautiful story. Oh, and thank you so much. It really hit home in a way that a lot of recent stories haven't for me. So thank you for that. It was wonderful to read. And I think that, as you mentioned, you are being a wonderful steward for these. (laughs) And I really hope to see you write more about them because it's fantastic. That makes me so happy to hear. Thank you uh, so much. I would love to come back. I'm not busy, if anyone's... (laughs) Um, I, I adore these, these boys and the history they're part of so much. I think I, as I said, I came to them as fans like that. 2005 I needed to see these characters on the page and there they were and I couldn't believe what I was seeing um I grew up in the era where I knew what Bobby's secret was but the page couldn't say it and you could always be gaslit into believing it wasn't there right and having these kids um express their feelings for each other and be part of this history that has been part of me since I was god 
six years old uh, was really important to me. Um, and it makes me glad to know I haven't bungled it entirely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when uh, when I first came out, I started researching queer history a lot. And I remember uh, watching Nick at Night growing up. So all these old time shows. And after coming out, I was like, wait a minute, like 40% of the actors on these shows were gay. Like I had no idea. <laughs> you watch something like Bewitched. But I have a 12 year old son who has come out now. And to be able to show him something like the Wiccan and Hulkling books and be like, look at this as an example of what you're reading. It's a completely different world we're in. And I'm, and I'm really grateful for that. So uh, thank you for all the beautiful work. So uh, you talk about digging deep into continuity. Let's begin with this conversation about Roy Thomas and, uh, and Jay Gavin slash Werner Roth here. Uh, he's coming in as a new writer. He's got to have an assessment of everything that's going on in the Marvel universe. He's got to look at the history. Back then, there's no internet, so it's all fan letters, people asking big questions, wondering what's happening. I think the biggest question in X-Men history up to this point is how did Professor X lose the use of his legs? And so here's the, the question answered. He's pulling back some villains that we haven't seen for a while. We last saw Lucifer in X-Men number nine when uh, they corner him, stop him from doing, destroying the planet and then let him go, if you <laughs> right. all remember that. And uh, Blob has given up crime and gone back to his uh, carnival. Eunice has agreed to never uh, fight the X-Men again because Beast built that gun that made Eunice not able to touch anything. Uh, so that's kind of where we're leaving off. We have these characters that the fans must have been hungry for, you know, whatever happened to Blob and Eunice, you know. Uh, so let's begin um, our uh, our conversation today by just looking at the cover. You guys all have it there in front of you. But what are some of your reactions if you were seeing this cover for the first time? I think my big reaction is the use of the color red and um, how very dominant it is in the background. When you're looking at everything in the foreground, you're seeing buildings that are really grayed out, but the sky is red. So that says to me that, you know, there's danger ahead in the form of whatever is coming. And, you know, Lucifer is bringing it. It's I, Lucifer. So um, it sets me up to already be expecting a battle with what's happening on this cover. Lucifer's pointy hat. Like it just comes to the crest. It makes me laugh so much. Uh, but I really like the act action sequence. I'm shocked by, if I'm a fan in the 60s, I'm shocked by Blob and Eunice who are easily identifiable, but they're wearing X-Men uniforms. Like, oh my God, yeah. what the hell? That's what struck me first. I was like, I know that that is the Blob and Eunice because it very obviously is, but they're wearing X-Men costumes, but also the X-Men are fighting them. And so that's what hit me first because I was like I know that they wouldn't have joined the X-Men but they're pretending to be X-Men. <laughs> I think there's a lesson here about making sure your costume is uh, technically difficult enough to execute that it can't be easily copied right like <laughs> this this <laughs> this yellow and blue pajama suit won't work for much longer. <laughs> I'm delighted by the jean at center with a giant bag of money sitting on top of her head that looks, it looks great. like a hat. <laughs> <laughs> She has money in her mind. Yeah, and I also love this like flat iron bank, this like Georgian architecture moment that uh, they're giving us. I like that a lot. I'm delighted that the colorist seems to never know what color to make Lucifer's hat. Um, <laughs> Lucifer has a lot of problems, I think, at a conceptual level as a, an effective character. And one of them is that his design is too Magneto-y, I think. <laughs> um, which is itself interesting. I mentioned Onslaught earlier. There was a moment in the 90s where it seemed like Onslaught was Lucifer. They were at least hinting at it, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, but uh, it's fun. We've got we've got Xavier in a nice little Indiana Jones moment, which is a lot of fun. Too. And he's walking. Yeah. He's got a little sidearm. Very nice. Lucifer pulling switches, which seems to be the main thing he does as a character. <laughs> When we saw him in X-Men 9, he had been in this cavern for like 10 years building a bomb. Yeah. Like, I've been here for a decade and my bomb is finally ready, which is ridiculous. And you diffused it in minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we also have, uh, it could simply say, I Lucifer in the bubble, but instead we get, our title is simply I Lucifer, enough said. I mean, it, you know, a little extra words to prove the point that <laughs> two words would have done. <laughs> yeah, not sure. I don't know what I Lucifer is a reference to. There's a book, a recent book called I Lucifer, but I can't think, I mean, I 
I do a podcast about Paradise Lost. If there was an I Lucifer before this, I'm not familiar with what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not confident actually. No, uh, the the nearest thing I can think of is I Claudius. So, yeah, it sounds like yeah. that, right? Yeah. But I guess that's what the I guess what we're being told is we will get some kind of background for who Lucifer is here, right? Which is what we are in fact going to get. So now in the next issue in X-Men 21, they're gonna give a an origin to Lucifer, but it won't cover this, so I'll cover it briefly. Later, 20 years later, when Mark Grenwald wrote the original official handbook, uh, there's an entry on Lucifer, and it's in that entry that they reveal that he's an alien who came to Earth. And he was inspired by the idea of biblical names for the devil. And so he chose Lucifer because it sounded menacing. So we'll learn that later in an obscure write-off somewhere. Uh, but yeah, we'll talk more about Lucifer next week a little bit as we delve into the history of his alien race. Uh, when we open the book, we have a, kind of a shocking beginning. We've got Blob teamed up with Eunice wearing the X-Men uniforms. And they are robbing a, a bank. Uh, Bob's... Uh, Bob... Bob is blob, if you add the L. Uh, blob's, blob's method of speech always makes me happy. You're the big razzmatazz of this joint, aren't you? As he holds up poor Mr. Filbert. Uh, yeah. we, <laughs> we see them kind of menacing the, uh, the public. And uh, the timed lock on the security vault is preventing them from robbing it. So Blob just rips it off his hinges. A security guard opens fire because, you know, that's what you do is when there's civilians around is you just start shooting people. They are not gun shy in this comic. That's no, sure. no, the bullets <laughs> bounce off of Blob. So he tries to shoot Eunice and they bounce off Eunice as well. We're lucky no one got hit in the, uh, in the crossfire. Uh, tell me some of your thoughts on these first couple pages as we see uh, Blob and Eunice robbing the bank and the police closing in. Well, I mean, the, the security officer does realize that he could endanger other people because he said he thinks before he shoots the big guy let go of Mr. Filbert now's my chance to take them without endangering anybody and so like he did have the thought about the civilians it just was for a moment as well thought about it should have been. <laughs> so I used to work as a crisis responder I'm a clinical social worker by trade and I responded to the scene of a robbery one time where there's a pharmacy that got robbed and the pharmacist jumped the counter and tackled the gunman and he ended up winning, but then he got fired because he like potentially put all of the civilians at rest uh, at risk when you're told to like, just get them out of there. I think this security guard very likely got fired right after. <laughs> uh, Daryl and Anthony, what are some of your thoughts on these first few pages? So what? Uh... Um, first of all, the first page, woman in red in her pillbox hat, talking about, I don't recognize these X-Men. I've never seen them in the newspaper. <laughs> How often are these people's pictures appearing in a newspaper? Because it, it is a slow news day. What else is going on in the community where they're printing up the pictures of costume teens often enough for the public to <laughs> be able to recognize them by sight? We have had we have had issues uh, prior to this where they're like, oh, you're Beast from the X-Men and oh, you're Iceman. I recognize you. So we, I think we have to assume retroactive continuity. This is sliding into the 2000s at this point, right? There, there's definitely been a couple Nightline specials on the X-Men at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but I and, do love her pillbox hat. It, yes. And um, Blob and uh, it, the one vowel off Eunice, um, very suspect name. Um, both of them just smoking some ciggies while they're I love it. hitting this crime like light it up. And if you look on the first page, it looks like they just lit up. So like they went in, started the commission of a crime and decided, <laughs> all right, who has the Marlboro Reds? Let's light up right now while we're in the middle of this. It's like making them look a little more menacing somehow to have a lit cigarette between their teeth. They're trouble. Uh, and, yeah, they're bad boys. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even maybe on page two, it looks like Eve is a swisher sweet, maybe. Um, maybe Blob likes some flavor in his carcinogen, but, you know, <laughs> good for them um, for making those choices. They're already committing a crime, so why not smoke indoors? He stopped at his local vape store and got the raspberry cheesecake flavor before heading inside. Ooh, you know yes. how it works. Well, at that point, aren't they allowed to smoke indoors in the 60s? Yes. Oh, so yeah. Like we so, have women chugging wine while they're pregnant. So yeah, so I'm like they're not fine. breaking another law by smoking in the building. <laughs> uh, 
Um, as we as we delve onto page three, we see them kind of turning against the police. And uh, Eunice gives a, a little speech where he says, nobody touches me unless I allow them to. So way to promote consent, Eunice. I mean, you do have a force <laughs> field, but consent is important. Uh, and then Blob's getting all mad. He reveals that they are not members of the X-Men. He just flat out states that he is the Blob. And then he crushes a car on his way out, steals a limousine. Uh, these guys are these guys are not uh, not taking any numbers. Uh, Anthony, what did you think of these opening pages? I'm, there's a lot that interests me here. One of them is that Blob seems to be sh shoeless. He's not wearing boots. And I'm yes. not sure if that's, I'm trying to think back, like, did they initially consider that he had to be barefoot for his power to work? Because he does have like the, you can't move him thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, I know he later has his little black booties, uh, but I'm not sure if at this moment they're thinking of his power as something that needs to be skin to skin. Um, no, the way, the way they portrayed in the original issues is if he has contact with the ground, he has control yeah. over his own gravity and density. But so is, he's, he's not, he's shoeless in those issues, right? Mm -hmm. Like he is so in his little purple diaper for his first few yeah. appearances. Yeah. We've seen him in X-Men 3 and X-Men 8 and he's barefoot in both and he's barefoot again here. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something cool happening there. I'm also fascinated by these two as a pair. Um, thinking back through I mean there's a maybe I'm reading into it I usually do but there's kind of a gay vibe happening throughout this issue <laughs> between these two they go on their little date together later um and that's kind of a weird recurring theme in the X-Men comics of this like kind of queer coded pair of villains that the X-Men fight like Unis and Blob might be kind of a proto version of it, but we later get like Avalanche and Pyro, um, Mystique Juggernaut and, and Black Tom, Juggernaut and Black Tom. Yeah, we get this kind of like these two, these two against the world is like a recurring thing that happens. And I get that we, I like that we get kind of a meet cute for them later. <laughs> I'm really charmed by them as a pair. I like as you said, I like Unis, um Blob's kind of carny voice that he always has. He's always calling people rubes, which I find really fun. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, uh, I don't know, has he been named yet? Is he Gunther Bane yet? Or is he Angelo Annunzione yet? Nope. Um, we do have Blob's name as Fred Dukes, but we don't know Unis's name yet. Right. I like that everyone's always talking about how athletic he is. There's something kind of hot about this, like, <laughs> this Italian stud. Can't touch. <laughs> <laughs> Obsessed with Unis. Miss him needs to come back <laughs> uh i will i will uh continuity deep dive here for a minute these two go on to join the team factor three together later on which we'll see in the original run and then they kind of become just buddies they hang out at the carnival together unis loses oh i always say unis and anthony you just like have me saying unis all of a sudden oh unis. i don't know i don't it's not even his name right so like i don't even know what it's it's a very stanley kind of name right he loves alliteration. So he had the untouchable. He needed something. Presumably it's from the Latin, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'll say I'll say Unis today. I kind of like it. It's like Uma Thurman. Okay. Uh, Unis, uh, <laughs> Unis loses control of his power sometimes to the point where he literally can't eat. And Blob's the only one that can feed him. He'll like push through oh, with his gravity oh, through the wow. through the force field and he'll give he'll give Unis some That's so food. sweet. But there's also an issue with Spider-Man. It's like Spectacular Spider-Man 197 or something. I'm not going to get my numbers quite right. Where Unis dies because he can't breathe. His force field closes in. And Blob has this huge giant grief fit. He like goes out into Times Square and sits in traffic and just, just sobbing. And Spider-Man <laughs> attacks him. And there's this big giant fight scene. It's very sad, actually. Uh, but it's kind of a brilliant scene. Uh, Unis comes back to life, you know, they all do eventually. But mm -hmm. yeah, these two are buddies and there's some grief. We'll talk more about how they met in just a minute. But Wow, uh, the idea that Blob is the only person who can penetrate Unis has a lot of directions to go in. That's yeah. interesting. We, okay. we get the word penetrate a lot in this issue. I don't know if you guys <laughs> noticed that or not. Uh, I, so, oh, go ahead. I, yeah, I have a question. Um, so obviously Blob, it, he has some tough calluses on his feet. I can appreciate this as someone who walks barefoot outside during the summer. Um, <laughs> but he is walking on broken glass and not feeling it. Annie so, Lennox. But, but they steal this limousine. Did they take the time, much like they took time to light up their Swisher sweeps, did they take time to hotwire a car? 
How did they do that? It must be because it's it's Mr. Filbert's limousine. Yeah, did they take the keys from Mr. <laughs> Filbert while they were roughing him up? Or I'm kind of like I'm gonna guess that the chauffeur was still in the car. Yeah. Oh, good call. Yeah, because I was like, if if his limousine, he's probably not the one driving it. So That's there's probably someone point. there with it. It's also a hot so. pink limousine. These two boys are leaving. This, like, <laughs> there's like a Thelma and Louise thing going on. I like it. <laughs> Uh, so we flip the page and we are with the X-Men. It's Roy Thomas on the X-Men first time. And the first scene we get, because he's picking up on character stuff that's already happened. Cyclops has been embarrassed and ashamed and worried about his eyes hurting someone. Uh, he can't take it anymore. He can't open up to Jean about how he cares about her. So he's quitting the team. He so, is out. So you're saying that Cyclops is running away from responsibility? No, never. With his emotions. <laughs> Not our Scott. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. We will never see this again. I mean, it only lasts a couple pages, but you know, poor Scott. We, are, we we do not know a lot about Scott at this point. We don't know anything about his origins, him being an orphan, uh, his head injury that caused his powers. Like we we don't we know very little. But he's always been the stoic, serious one. So this is kind of his whole character right here. He's the he's the leader who pines for Gene and worries about his eyes, and uh, he's 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 quitting. He's out. Leaves the note behind. And this is a big. Um hallmark of Thomas, right? That he shifts the book into a much more soap opera milieu. Um, the X-Men does become kind of a teen soap under him. Whereas Stanley, you sort of mentioned this already. Stanley is really interested in, uh, he's coming into a very 60s pop art kind of moment. There's a lot of ways that the Marvel comics are thinking about superhero as celebrity, whether it's Spider-Man as a wrestler or obviously the Fantastic Four or the Avengers as this like very public facing mm -hmm. um, commune, right? They're, yeah, I was just rereading the issue where they fight um, Lucifer for the first time and they're like taking churn, turns being chairman and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Thomas quite, astutely senses that the 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 soap angle is the angle to play with the x-men right which obviously chris claremont like runs with as far down the field as he possibly can um but yeah here it is sort of he gets he gets the voice of each of these characters immediately right like this panel of the four of them and like angel being annoyingly helpful in quote marks to Gene was like uh, it seems you have once again forgotten how my power works and like Bobby glued to the TV and Beast being too um, loquacious <laughs> <laughs> except Bobby calls the TV a boob tube and I just about lost it <laughs> <laughs> that's like an old 60s phrase for TVs they'd, they'd call it the boob tube a lot back when my mom was a kid we've talked about this uh, I've talked about this with her a few times I don't know why that became the reference, but yeah, that was like a euphemism for television back then. The boob Yeah, because I'm like, at that point, you couldn't show anything on TV that even like resembled a boob. So I don't know. <laughs> I think it's because you are a boob for watching it is the idea, right? Like it's mm -hmm. like a, you're, it's like a boob and a rube. <laughs> like you are, you're a clown for wasting your time on. I love his power clashing outfit, by the way, the orange blouse mm. on top of the mustard pants god bless bobby good for you <laughs> very <laughs> and, very nice i have a question relating to this so uh, charles says that he was um mentally monitoring the telecast does that mean he gets free cable <laughs> and does it include premium is he getting cinemax and stars and hbo as well we just learned we'll learn at the end of the issue that he just bought a jet so he can afford right. cable <laughs> He's probably pirating is... it, but he can afford it. <laughs> he, he's getting more than the big three somehow, mentally, back then. Um, he's getting CBS, NBC, ABC. Maybe he's seeing into the future and getting Fox, even. So it's very possible. He has a weird relationship with technology in the original run. Uh, he he yeah, can read I don't robot understand. minds and boost his powers and all kinds of things. Uh, what was that, Heather? Oh, I said, I don't always understand how his power interacts with technology because that's just not how science works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we get Beast walking in on Professor X. They've, they've, they, so they've seen, the, they've seen the footage of the bank robbery on the news. Beast walks in on Professor X by saying, Professor X, pardon my uh, unce unceremonious intrusion. And I, I'm like, if Beast ever released a fragrance, that would, that would be its mm. name. Un <laughs> unceremonious intrusion by Hank McCoy. 
<laughs> but Professor Professor X has installed a new Cerebro unit because Magneto destroyed the last one, and uh, we get we get Warren thinking. I have never seen the Professor looking any grimmer than he is right now, and I'm thinking back to like when the Juggernaut was ready to stomp. Professor X into pieces and Professor X was having a full on like PTSD episode, but you know, no grimmer than right now. So Angel has a short memory. He also <laughs> doesn't look that grim there. He's got, <laughs> he looks actually pretty, he looks well rested. He's youthful looking. He's there. showing off his new technology. Yeah. He just got this new projector and look at it kids. So we've got, a radar, we've got a radar image beam. He is projecting the images of Eunice and the blob up on the wall in, uh, in some sort of uh, jagged line. I don't know. I'm thinking of like submarine technology where it's like the image like whoa, whoa, up on the, the sonograph. Up, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like sonar <laughs> is happening somehow. Charles, yeah. just give that a couple of thumps on top of it to clear up the signal. Just <laughs> tap that one, it'll clear right up. And they recognize Eunice and Blob. Beast immediately remembers the gun that he built to uh, affect Eunice's powers, which, uh, which is smart. Uh, but uh, the X-Men are alerted and Xavier immediately senses that someone is behind this. So in his thought bubble, you see him kind of scanning uh, for all of their past foes. Could it be Vanisher, Juggernaut, Magneto, the Sentinels, Mastermind, the Submariner, but someone is blocking your thoughts. It's probably the guy that tried to destroy the planet that you let go, Xavier. That's probably who it is. It's a, it's a good thing to think about. <laughs> Process of this elimination. Panel. This is one of my all time favorite panels, actually. It's like- Why? I just, every time I can't remember a person's name when I run into them, I think of this panel where he's just like, <laughs> what is their name? Like he's trying to, it's such a, an amazing visual representation of like how you cycle through names and can't think of one. Um, I do kind of like, you, you mentioned, I think it was Heather who mentioned this, like I do think Roy Thomas starts to focus Xavier's powers more specifically in like a telepathy direction. Whereas I do find with a lot of the Stan Lee issues, it's more of a like spooky psychic power. Like he does seem to be able to like predict things and like, yeah, read robot minds and stuff. I do think Thomas does start to, there's still some shaky moments, but it does start to resemble more like what we think of as like standard telepathy, right? Like a chrysalis, a chrysalids kind of moment where it's like, it is about reading organic minds and stuff. Um, but yeah, I love this panel. It's so good. <laughs> I, I'm picturing a comic book version of you. Someone's like, hey, Anthony. And you're like, oh, especially no. after COVID where it's like, I haven't <laughs> said another human's name in two years. <laughs> oh my God. I've seen so many people post COVID where I don't remember their names or exactly even how I know them. Yeah, that's a problem lately. Uh, so Professor X can't figure out who's behind all of this. And so his first thought is I need to build a mechanical memory inducer to quickly penetrate our foes defenses. <laughs> we get our first penetrate, but not our last. There will be mm. lots of penetration in this issue, everyone. Don't, <laughs> don't you worry. Including uh, my favorite splash coming up soon. Of oh, yep, <laughs> yep, we're gonna get there. Uh, so we flip back to we flip back to uh, well, not back to we flip to Lucifer for the first time. He's in some sort of mysterious cave with all kinds of technology, watching and manipulating events from afar. Uh, and then we get a a flashback to when uh, Unis and Blob met and how Lucifer. Uh, influenced them. Uh, Daryl, do you want to take over uh, talking about this scene? Yeah, I mean, we're at the carnival and we get Lucifer. He is dressed up as a 1920s grifter for some reason. So he, he dug out his straw hat and we see him really uh, pushing Blob towards, why don't you challenge Unis? They say that he's untouchable, but Blob, you got it going on. You can do this. And Blob is like, you're right. I can. So he gets mostly naked and he's in his purple tights and he's going up against Unis and he's like, oh wow, you're actually really good. And I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And he's like, hey, you know what? Why don't you meet me at my trailer out back? And if that is not a pre-grinder grinder message, I don't know what is. My question, and I think we get it answered on page seven, but if Unis and Blob are involved, who's the top? Unis. Unis is right there on Blob's back. He's he's all up there. And uh, he is he is latched. He is latched on. He's not letting go. 
we also get the banner on Unis's uh, on on Unis's sign. It says a hundred dollars to anyone who can last three full minutes with Unis the Untouchable. I have a lot of uh, girlfriends who talk about their straight hookups, and I don't think Unis is going to last three minutes. I'm <laughs> obsessed with these two. I think this is he, such a cute little date. <laughs> Unis is probably the epitome of a three pump chump. So, but. It, they have if, so much in common. They do. It, they're, th- I think they have found their soulmate in one another through wrestling in front of a crowd. They're a bit of uh, an exhibitionist couple, which I am not here to shame anyone's preferences. So if that is what they need. In this house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just fascinated by how it makes, at a conceptual level, not a lot of sense to pair them because it to me, draws attention to how similar their powers are, right? Like, you wouldn't put these, especially since they appeared back to back, right? Like, or no, wait, but Blob is number three, Unis, and he's back in five, five? When is Unis was in, uh, in number eight. Oh, so it's, Blob is three and seven then, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like, they both, they both oddly also have defensive powers, right? Like, they're not actually great about it's not clear to me at this level yet whether they have super strength or not, although Blob did trash that car. Um, but like, if you attack them, you can't hit them. That's the idea, right? Like you can't hurt them. And that's that's cool as a villain idea in general, because it does require the X-Men be aggressors, but pairing them had, does a good job of drawing out the differences, right? Like Unis's power deflects, whereas Blob seems to have some kind of momentum thing where like, you hit it and the bullet drops rather than going flying across the room. I think that's really cool. Um, I think it was Heather that pointed out uh, in, in our eighth episode as well that they also face the Vanisher whose basic power is you can't touch me. So we kind of yeah. have like three in a row where it's like different reasons, but they can't be touched. Uh, during their foreplay wrestling scene, I just have to point <laughs> out, Unis, Unis calls Blob a hippo. Uh, and then Blob talks about whether or not Unis can swallow those words or not. Again, there's there's a lot of like subtext here and not very subtle wording. I don't know. Heather, did you see these two as uh it was it kind of a date for you? Um, I mean it was definitely cute. <laughs> and and now that I'm reading one of the panels, Blob says you took the words right out of my mouth. Come on over to my carney in an hour and don't forget that hundred bucks. So uh is he getting paid? I think There's neither of them could finish and they just chose to friend zone. Like, let's just be best friends now since we can't, we can't finish the fight. Uh, and then we also realize a little later, Lucifer is influencing their thoughts, which we'll see more of next issue. He's got technology that can alter people's thoughts and memories. He's blocking himself from Professor X, but he's the one that inspires these two to put on the X-Men costumes and go ride, uh, rob the bank. So I think he's trying to draw the X-Men out of hiding since he can't figure out uh, where they are. Um, nice and- that they have a shipper, right? It's nice that Lucifer is setting up this blind date. That's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they're besties forever. Thanks, Lucifer. Uh, <laughs> so we flash back to the bank and uh, Cyclops has walked up. So his, his vacation from the X-Men was not long. Oh, we didn't comment, by the way. He left a note for the X-Men and Professor X was basically like, oh, we, I hear you, but we don't have time to worry about that right now. <laughs> we'll look for Cyclops later. Uh, but here's Cyclops trying to, uh, trying to kind of stand up for uh, the X-Men. And Unis and Blob brilliantly kind of were like, hey, there's our teammate. He's come here to help us rob the bank because they're all dressed <laughs> in the same costume. Uh, Anthony, do you want to talk to us about the fight scene that follows? Uh, I love this beat on page seven where Cyclops is like, surely no one's stupid enough to believe this. And then we like immediately see the crowd being like, wow, you were right. Listen to them. Like it's, uh, that's very funny to me. And I similarly love the gag throughout that as he's blasting them to his great annoyance, Blob and Unis are like, we're so glad you're here. Help us carry this back. And every time he does something to them, they're like, uh, uh, there's a beat where they always spin it. Like, um, uh, there's this beat on page eight where Unis is like, if you can't lead a heist, you always try to foul it up, right? Like he he's he's not only <laughs> it's just good comedy. He's not only trying to hurt them, but they're reflecting it back and the audience is stupid enough to fall for it. Where like I'm actually quite chilled by this line from the crowd on the bottom of eight where um 
this blonde white lady is like, get the youngest one first. He looks like he's the most dangerous, right? Like the way they instrumentalize uh, the anti-mutant sentiment of the crowd kind of throughout this comic is really fascinating to me, especially since that's kind of, even though it's quite vague, how Lucifer's not even powers technology works, but like, that's what he does, right? Like he sort of foments uh, a mob mentality, both in the flashback and in his previous appearance, right? Like he, he influences crowds just the same way he's influencing Blob and Unis here. Um, so it is, this issue is sort of in a weird way thinking around the problem of mobs and the problem of um, forming alliances and like uh, using anti-mutant sentiment against the X-Men. I think that's really cool. I love this frown on Cyclops. <laughs> You know, and then the the commentary now, obviously, I, my my partner and I uh, in Salt Lake City, we feel pretty safe walking around and holding hands. But if we're any like rural small towns in Wyoming or Idaho, we don't feel safe uh, being two dads with two kids in public because you feel like the crowd's going to turn on you. It's going to be that one person that says, get the youngest one first. Mm. And I think, you know, people of color, is that's obviously something that they struggle with as well when you're in an unsafe space. But we see more and more of this in the X-Men in these early issues kind of from here. Uh, we've seen multiple examples of crowds forming to kind of chase down the mutants. It's very, uh, I keep saying, kill the beast, like, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Beauty and the Beast when they're storming the castle. Uh, but we get a lot of these types of moments. Uh, it's adorable that the crowd is chasing Cyclops while Unis and Blob are trying to put all their money back in the bag because <laughs> Cyclops knocked it down. Uh, but a Angel is closing in uh, and uh, Lucifer in full, oh, he's so angry, uh, shaking fists at the sky, continues to uh, manipulate events. Uh, the beast, it gets there with his ray gun and it does not work on, on Unis anymore because Lucifer has blocked it. So we now have one of their biggest defenses no longer working. So Heather, I'm really sorry to tell you, you don't get to see Unis fumbling for pie in this issue. Uh, no, my pie, I can't grab it. <laughs> Disappointing, but I'll make it through. <laughs> uh, so the X-Men all arrive and they are fighting. Uh, uh, Heather, do you want to take over uh, talking about this fight scene for the next couple pages, nine and 10? Yeah. Um, so, you know, like you said, the gun doesn't work. And so Unis is like, well, now we're really going to fight. And he says, I've been waiting for this moment for more than a year. And Beast, because Beast can't keep his mouth shut, he goes, a true paragon of patience. <laughs> and, um, so Unis goes after Beast and Iceman and Blob are fighting and then Iceman puts some ice on the sidewalks so neither of them can stand up and they think that they're doing okay but then the crowd starts attacking the X-Men. Um, one lady is beating at Beast with an umbrella. Yeah That's and <laughs> she is my hero. What, <laughs> what a character. Um, Anthony, I don't know if you ever want to make a proposal for a one shot, <laughs> but if we could get this woman's story. This elderly bigot with her umbrella. <laughs> get the elder, yes, I think we could sell millions of copies. People of love her, yeah. <laughs> or this cop who's just like, now if you don't stop that, I will shoot you and gives him exactly one panel of time <laughs> to respond before he starts shooting at a teenager like in the sky. Great, love bullets. with this guy, yeah. That moment of Beast getting hit with the umbrella is a little cathartic though. Uh, for all of us reading current comics, Beast is very hard to like. So I kind of, I want to take an umbrella and just whap him over the head. So it made me happy, I'll admit. It is amazing <laughs> the, co the consistency of his character, right? Like this, when he first fought Unis, he developed this gun. He's like, the, obviously the thing to do is make him more powerful. And the X-Men are like, please don't do that. And he's like, no time to explain. And then he just did it, right? Like Hank McCoy has been consistent since the earliest days of the X-Men as being like um, an autocrat who always thinks he knows what's best and has no time to explain to these simpletons what it is he's going to do and usually aggravates the problem so much worse than it had to be. Uh, so there is a way that this old lady hitting him with an umbrella has made an excellent point, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I was here for it because my singular note for page nine was, I'm already tired of Beast. And then I flip the page and he's getting hit with an umbrella. <laughs> Unless he's adoring over his toes. Uh, I, that's, I love that beast, but, um, but yeah, no, he's a lot sometimes. And then maybe the most bizarre moment of the issue, and this is an issue with lots of crazy sci-fi, but 
Cyclops blasts a section of ground underneath Beast and Eunice, and there's like a whole giant like section of bridge that's been blasted out. I don't know how that works, but the uh, the two land on the subway and they are gone. Beast and Unis yeah. disappear, uh, leaving the X Men to Unis? figure out what's that. Blob and Unis. Did I just say Beast and Unis? Yes. Pardon me. Yes, Blob and Unis disappear. That was an important clarification. Thank you. Uh, Thank leaving you. leaving the X Men to try to figure out uh, uh, what is going on. Uh, so we get to snapshot back to uh, the slingshot. I'm having a tough time with words right now for some reason. We, we <laughs> well, switch that back to Lucifer. Oh, go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, one second. You blasted over the most homophobic line in this story on page 10 where someone calls Iceman Fudgesicle Freak. And oh, I, I would like to take ownership. I'm going to take that term back. Um, anyone can call <laughs> me a Fudgesicle Freak. But... They're, calling that, I, they're calling Iceman that, right? Yes. So, Yep, yep. Yeah, that's homophobic. People in the crowd. <laughs> it is Unis it, who says it. It's Unis. Unis yeah. of all people, Unis. But he's projecting, yeah. you know, yeah. it's internalized homophobia. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that I noted that. That's a pretty terrible thing to say. That's awful. Straight up. Uh, we flip back to Lucifer, who's in his secret base. And I'm just going to read two of his word bubbles out loud. He said, so the one I seek, referring to Professor X, uh, most still closets himself in secrecy, eh? So we literally get the word closets. And then, uh, but Lucifer knows not the meaning of defeat. Uh, a moment later, he says, my mental wave receiver indicates that Professor Xavier has already penetrated my mental screen. So even from the closet, Professor X is still penetrating Lucifer's mental screen. Thoughts? And what happened? I well, what happens right after he says that? A giant dick emerges from a mace. <laughs> <laughs> it is wild that of all the full page splashes, the one we get is of this huge mechanical penis. Oh, it doesn't mm -hmm. show on the screen for you guys, but like, uh, it's literally just a big red dick coming out of a mesa in the desert that starts blasting at Xavier. It's like yeah, already not, not subtle. <laughs> it's like already ejaculating as it arrives from the ground. Mm -hmm there's a there's a zzz sound effect and it's already just yeah Heather, i'm intrigued by lucifer's lucifer is one of the few characters i can think of in superhero comics who has a beard that's like an odd that's not really a character design you see much in superhero comics um, it's a it's a terrible beard though it's like, really bad <laughs> he yeah. needs beard hair yeah is he shaving out the part under his lip like is it literally just a neck beard is that <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Iceman also has a beard in Zelda. That's right. Good old Zelda. Oh. <laughs> she had a good arc, though, in X Factor and stuff. She, she I, went on to good things. I adore her. Uh, <laughs> Heather, did you want to comment on the phallic building emerging from the ground? I mean, sometimes you just got to let the phallic building speak for itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes it's not is a whole what it's lot saying. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it works. So this this blast that goes off is meant to weaken uh, Professor X and bypass his defenses. And it basically slows his heart rate down and makes him a little bit almost catatonic. He's kind of stuck there. Uh, Jean Grey, who's still wearing this god awful cowl. One day mm. it will be gone, but I will comment on it every time until then. I hate it so much. Uh, Jean Grey listens for his heartbeat. She is kind of emerging uh, a little bit as a telepath here. She's able to sense some of his inner thoughts. And uh, he starts projecting a design to her uh, that will help him uh, get back in control of himself. Uh, what did you guys think of this interaction between Xavier and Jean here? I think Jean was really able to step up because none of the men are trying to take charge and be like oh no girl I got this and she and so she really gets to kind of not necessarily come into her own and like take over but she actually gets to be a hero for a second which she doesn't always get a chance to because the boy's the worst <laughs> <laughs> you got to sing your song for us now that Charles is a dick. Mm -hmm. That one. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, except you know, there's the the building, the phallic building is a little more of a dick, but he's still a little bit. Still, yeah. 
Uh, so Heather, can I have you take over? So we got like five pages of origin story for Professor X. And uh, so uh, in continuity, and we won't learn this about Xavier for a long time, but we're talking post-college. He's been through war already. Uh, he very likely has already met, not very likely, he's already met Magneto and Gabrielle Haller back when he could walk. There's a lot of history that we'll learn later. But this is kind of a, an era of his life when he's kind of traveling around the world going on crazy adventures. Uh, so Heather, will you take uh, these five pages and kind of summarize uh, the origin story that Professor X provides for Jean here? Well, first of all, he said, when she's like, oh, I can hear your thoughts. He says, good, then heed my words for I may have little time. And then he goes on to tell this huge story, just like whenever he was trying to talk about the juggernaut, he's like, we have to hurry. And then he proceeds to tell his entire life story because he Charles loves a captive Xavier. audience does not know how to be concise. But anyway, so he goes to Tibet and there's this city there and it, there's a walled city in the shadows of the Himalayas. And he's like, hey, I wanna go in. And the guards are like, well, no, you, we can't let outsiders in except I think you should be allowed admittance, which we all know means that Xavier was in fact manipulating his brain because that's what he does. Mm -hmm. So then he goes into the city and he's like, hey, who lives in the big castle over there? And they're like, oh, that's our leader, but we're not allowed to see him. And he realizes how it all is going on. And so he's like, hey, well, he, so this alien, because apparently Lucifer's an alien and not just a mutant, he is able to control selected minds among the people and then they keep the other citizens in line. And so he goes to find like the rebellious underground. And he's like, hey, I can help you. But Lucifer takes over the mind of one of the dudes and he's like, he tries to kill them all and whatnot. And then they get into the castle, but they're almost killed and Charles saves them. And then there's a giant fireball and he saves them again because they go into a room of water. And <laughs> Then, as they're doing that, Lucifer gets a call from the Supreme boss. One. <laughs> yeah, which is apparently his boss. And he's like, hey, people have broken into my castle, but don't worry, I'm going to kill them. And the Supreme One says, no, you spent enough time there. We're, we already have a new sanctuary ready for you at the next location. And so um, Lucifer runs off and runs into Charles and lucifer brings down a thing of concrete a great slab um and crushes charles's legs and charles then sees lucifer opening a portal and disappearing into the very wall itself and then he says and then he's thinking to himself but what did, why does he mean who does he mean by we is he actually the herald of a far greater menace from the stars and so he lost the use of his legs because lucifer dropped a slab of concrete on his legs so uh beautiful summary thank you so in these five pages we get kind of an effective flashback it's one contained story it builds there's a lot of character added to professor x uh, and frankly to lucifer as well we learn why these two have such a sordid history this is the man who paralyzed charles xavier so it's kind of his mortal enemy, even in a way that Magneto isn't. Uh, Anthony, what were your thoughts on this flashback story? What did you like? What was uh, ridiculous? Yeah, well, obviously we're getting kind of a, I keep thinking about Indiana Jones, but this is well before anyone is thinking about Indiana Jones, but it has that kind of uh, for good and ill, right? Like it is kind of a weird orientalist, colonialist pastiche, right? Like this, which most of Xavier's <laughs> adventures post-war are, right? We've seen already actually even in the run you've covered with Juggernaut and um, finding the, the, the gem of Sidorak and everything. Um, and we'll see it again later with Shadow King, right? When he's in Cairo. Um, this is a model of even the, the Gabriel Haller stuff and Magneto, right? In Israel, right? Like this is the, the Haifa stuff. Like um, this is a model for Xavier for good and ill that sort of tells us about him he's he's the white guy who goes into places and saves the day right from these mutant or non-mutant menaces um as far as the lucifer stuff i find it 
variously compelling and dissatisfying. Um, it's interesting to give him a foe that is his own, that has such a personal and deep connection to his own kind of traumas. Uh, but what's annoying to me about it is like making it an alien enemy is kind of dismaying because it makes Lucifer harder to tie into the rest of the mythology, right? Like I do think there's a reason that when Ultimate X-Men retells the story of Xavier's paralysis, it makes it a violent act by Magneto. And similarly, when the films do it, they make it kind of this, again, compromised expression of Magneto's rage that leaves his friend um, hurt. Uh, so I find that odd. I also find it kind of perfunctory that it's just like this slab that falls from the sky. Yeah. Um, I do think, but conversely the beat as lucifer is leaving is like to the heart of xavier's crisis because what he says is remember this it is ever the strong who are meant to rule and we are the strong and in a lot of ways that is the philosophy against which xavier is constantly positioning himself whether it is magneto or apocalypse um the idea that our gifts make us better than is the thing that Xaviorism as a philosophy, as this kind of neoliberal, let's just all get along and blend in. And if I show you I'm a good citizen, you'll stop beating me up in a mob, uh, positions itself against, right? So having someone say that to him, at the moment he is so brutally traumatized is interesting to me and is compelling to me. Um, Lucifer never really gets hooked into the larger X-Men. No one would list him as like a top 20 villain, <laughs> right? So, so I'm interested in him, even as I'm kind of disappointed by him is I guess where I land on this. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll talk again more about Lucifer next time, but he doesn't really come back to the X-Men after this next issue, 21. He, he shows up in the Avengers and uh, in some other places, Captain America. Uh, and then he's kind of just written out at a certain point. We will yeah. see more of him. And there's some um, pretty popular stories with him. And uh, we'll talk about Dominus in just a moment. Um, but uh, they're not X-Men stories, really. And uh, it's okay. worth, sorry, I'm just thinking, I did mention it earlier, so it's worth mentioning again. There was a moment in the 90s where he was linked to Onslaught, which it, for Heather, for example, if you're not <laughs> reading ahead, Onslaught is uh, becomes an expression of Xavier and Magneto's um, dynamism as an entity he becomes literally he's like their weird psychic child like xavier's powers with magneto's methodology um but he kind of they're, because he's a nine rage character. baby yeah um, <laughs> but he kind of sucks and so one of the ways he, he's he's back now in way of x but for a brief moment during operation zero tolerance it is suggested that onslaught is actually a persona of lucifer's um and because Lucifer has this kind of crowd control telepathy thing, it makes a kind of sense, but that never goes anywhere. And I think he's now been decapitated by Archangel later, but um, he's he's never quite developed. This race, the Quistalians, never gets quite developed. Um, someone could do something with this. I don't know. Absolutely. Someone. There's a there's there's <laughs> something to be considered here as well. When I was growing up as a fan in the 90s, uh, uh, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, again, pre-internet, so if I wanted to go find the answers, I had to go look up the back issues and these were too expensive. So Marvel did some reprints of the original books. And I remember reading this for the first time, like, oh, that's how Professor X lost his legs. Why have they never talked about this in the comics again? We get him, you know, referencing some of the trauma that happened, uh, but this, it's kind of an issue that people just forgot. But I love that Roy Thomas filled in the blank. Uh, Daryl, mm -hmm. what were your thoughts on these, on these origin pages? Um, I think we've sort of touched on it with both Heather and Anthony, it's Charles being the white savior coming in, swooping in to save these local people. Also, I was struck by the Christian iconography of somewhere in the Himalayas. There are mm -hmm. crucifixes everywhere. So mm -hmm. it really struck me as definitely a 1960s child's version of the Himalayas that they are trying to convey as the setting. Um, Oh, I hadn't noticed that. You're right. There's like, this castle is covered in like a, a Knights Templar kind of aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, the helmets that we have being sported, I like to think that they both have high ponytails underneath those. <laughs> so they need the room for them to go up and then down. 
Do you ever watch uh, Adventure Time where you get uh, when Jake the human, or wait, Finn the human finally pulls his cowl off and it's this long flowing like princess hair that comes out. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, a couple of brief comments for me on page 14, final panel, we get Xavier's crazy eyes again, like the eyes floating in space. We don't, we haven't seen that in a while. Uh, we also get on 15 in the first panel, kind of a new visual for his powers. These like little wavy, almost food aroma lines, like you'd see in a mm -hmm. Bugs Bunny cartoon kind of uh, extending from his head. Uh, and I love, uh, I love page uh, 17 that the two middle panels where you get the close up on like creepy looking Lucifer and then he flips around and there's this giant screen of this massive green crazy head. He looks like Electro from Spider-Man with his little lightning bolts and coloring. Uh, Yet another terrible beard. It seems to be like a, a species problem. <laughs> that's how you recognize a quiz if you have a terrible beard. Run, run, run. Uh, so Gene has been enlightened. Gene is setting being set up here again. Uh, and it happens more and more as time goes by as Xavier's secret keeper. Later when Professor X, and we'll get to that in the run initially, when Professor X fakes his own death uh, at the hands of the Xenox with Changeling posing as him, Gene's the only one that knows the truth. Uh, so we, we see this example of, of Professor X confiding things in Gene, the secrets that she is uh, meant to keep. Uh, Daryl, do you want to sum up the last couple of pages for us or, or what happens there? Yeah, so um, we basically get an unsatisfying resolution to... Um, because this is a continuation. This is not going to be resolved this issue. So we get the cliffhanger. Um, the most exciting thing I think is that we get the X-Jet mm -hmm. hanger. And um, it seems like when they were getting ready to take off and yeah, we are going to take this battle to Lucifer, um, they were, there's an ice slide, they're loading things up. It seems like they're maybe taking along some cargo for Amazon. Um, maybe they're doing some <laughs> shipped sort of stuff on the side, um, trying to pay for that plane because that's a lot of luggage. And it, Beast, he's trying to look like he's being helpful, but he's just balancing empty boxes on his feet. So he's just trying to show off, which it's Hank. So I'm not surprised. Um, but we get our heroes, they, they know what the gig is. We get Professor X revitalized within a wonderful helmet. Um, he looks like a specimen in a scientific collection here. Or he, it, it gives me space gene vibes from the 90s. Mm -hmm. So um, same look, Gene went into outer space and had a similar helmet in the 90s. Maybe it's a callback to this wonderful design. It even has a little speech box for him, which is handy. Uh, Professor X uh, projects the thoughts into Beast's mind or Gene's mind uh, to build a beam distorter. So the fishbowl he's wearing helps block him from Lucifer's powers. Uh, a, a key moment here too, is we get a zoom in on this green. Is the, is the alien green, the Supreme one, is his helmet green in your comics? Yes. yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. there's color distortion sometimes. So when, when I see green, so other people will see pink or something. Uh, but he threatens this big looming threat of Dominus. Uh, so I don't know if you guys are subs or doms, but if you had <laughs> Dominus coming, would you like him to wear the same costume Lucifer has? Is that what you want your dom in? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit too bulky. Like if there's going to be a dom in the mix like you're going to need something more like there is a the semi loincloth i mean yeah. there are a lot of layers and if someone's going to be a dom you know what that's not the way to do it you're not wearing a lot of baggy pants um and the layers they're going to cover everything he does have like a big, they both have like big condom hats though. Those yeah, are, yes. That's it, the, the headgear is ridiculous. Um, we they also... really do have, I mean, it is really, I've kind of already said this, but it is really odd to me how much Lucifer looks like a rough copy of Magneto. Like mm -hmm. it does kind of look like someone is figuring out like the color blocking for a Magneto costume, but the fit is all wrong. It kind of looks like, um, the first time we see Michael Fassbender in the Magneto costume at the end credits of that movie where it's like, oh, I don't love this design, but he's like, call me Magneto. And it's like the same kind of like baggy look to it. <laughs> um, 
I like the Supreme one or whatever his name is even less. Cause as you said, it does kind of look like a rough draft of Electro with the like yellow lightning on the head with the green. Um, I am kind of compelled by the idea that maybe their heads are this shape and the helmet just kind of fits correctly. <laughs> His, the Supreme one's eyes are really creepy too. They're like a boxy, like yeah. triangle. It's it. Yeah. He's it's effective. I think, I think they're fun villains. Uh, uh, we also get a key moment between Cyclops and Gene. Cyclops snaps at Gene here. Uh, oh yeah. Okay. Quiet Gene. Lucifer's almost beat us before. And she in her thought bubbles is like the way Scott snapped at me a while ago. How could I have ever thought he might care for me? Like, oh, she's so tender hearted and he is so scared of, of hurting her. Uh, so much angst, so much angst. Mm. Between them. Any thoughts on that Scott Gene interaction? They play this game for a while, right? Where he's like, I must be the leader and therefore mean. And she's like, oh, but he's being mean. He must not like me, right? Like this is going to happen for a bit. Is her color signature already pink? Have we already arrived at the the pink pink gene powers? There's been a couple of brief panels where you'll see pink lines, but no, mm -hmm. no, no, uh, no amoeba, no pink amoeba surrounding her as she flies mm -hmm. or anything yet. We'll get there. As you said, it is interesting. It's kind of hard to remember that she's not a telepath yet in continuity. So it is interesting the way this like this hilarious headgear she's wearing that even she thinks looks stupid is like. Pre getting us ready for the idea of Jean as a protege to Xavier's telepathy. Yeah. I similarly like the idea of like, what if there was a fishbowl shaped helmet that could block telepathy? Like we're actually still, what, 40 years away from Magneto's helmet doing that, mm -hmm. but there's like a prototype for it here <laughs> on the page. <laughs> We uh we also see uh, as as uh, Daryl mentioned the X jet being revealed now Xavier mm -hmm. has like a fuck ton of helicopters in some random garage that they keep bringing <laughs> right. out in every <laughs> issue uh, but this is yeah this is kind of a prototype of the Blackbird their their famous ship in a weird way uh, and th yeah they're off uh, they're off to fight so if you guys are just evaluating these aliens Lucifer in this issue uh, also Unis and Blob fa falling into here but what did you think of them as villains was this an effective threat for the X Men to face I think we get the I think we get the camp and the hijinks of the Unis Blob mix but then like the world conquering threat of of uh, uh, Lucifer behind the scenes and they don't even really know it's him. So I think, I think it's an effective balance. We get the comedy, but also the danger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have kind of a team rocket thing at the end where they're like, I guess we're out of here when they're on the train. Like there's something really fun about <laughs> them just like, <laughs> screw it. Like we're gone. And it's like the issue, they actually have the editorial note of like, they'll be back sometime. <laughs> like, okay, whatever. I hope they have like a good vacation together after all this. Um, if Lucifer has done nothing else, he brought those two crazy kids together. So I'm happy for that. <laughs> Which is an effective uh, point to ask. We always ask, uh, who, what was your favorite single moment in this issue if you chose one? And who was your star player if you could only choose one? Am I going first? I love yeah, the sure. moment. I love the moment where Blob is like, perhaps we could have a coffee and see what else we have in common. Like that's like a, that's a clearly a come on. I really like that. <laughs> uh, that's my favorite beat. And who was your favorite character? Oh, hard to pick. I think I'm going to have to pick the pair of them. Blob and Unis together as like a sort of discovering their energy together is a lot of fun and surprising to me as a reader, but also clearly to them as like a, as a dynamic duo. <laughs> and I, would, oh, their, go ahead, would their couple name be Blueness? Um, <laughs> are, are we shipping Blueness? I think it's, I think it's got to be Blueness. Otherwise you're like, oh, no. A knob, yeah, they're both. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm gonna. We're gonna trend blueness on, uh, on Twitter for the twelve people in the world who know who. who these... <laughs> uh, my favorite moment, I think, if I had to choose one, just because I got the most satisfaction, was the old woman hitting Beast on the head with the umbrella. Mm. It's not a fine moment, but I just, I was... mine too. Yep, yep. Uh, and then Professor X, if I'm thinking as a reader, Professor X's origin story is my favorite part of this uh, of this series. So Professor X gets my Star Player Award, which is rare for me. I don't care for him much in the early books, uh, but I, I love that we got that origin bit here. Heather, I similarly seem to get the impression you are a Professor Xavier is a jerk uh, person. <laughs> is that right? My song. <laughs> <laughs> We did a I, I we did a two and a half hour trial of Professor X, and all of us were like, Ugh. 
<laughs> by the end. <laughs> Heather, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, I sing that song at least once an episode <laughs> because I truly, truly believe that Charles is a dick. Mm. What was his worst moment here? In of this <laughs> many terrible moments. Is it when he keeps telling people that if they use their powers again, he'll ruin their lives? <laughs> <laughs> My, in my opinion, the worst thing he's done in the original run is uh, where he pretends to be wounded for an entire issue, lets the X-Men fawn over him and take care of him. He can't even feed himself. And then he sends them into space to fight Magneto. They nearly die. And when they get back, he goes, by the way, I was just kidding. My Jeez. powers were never hurt in the first place. Awful, that's my, that's, that's the biggest dick move, I think. Yeah, and then there's all the stuff that will be retconned into the awful things he's doing, including suppressing genes telepathy, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's, oh, God. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> Heather, do you have a single, like, worst cringe moment with Charles? Uh, there's so many. There's so many. <laughs> Just every time he uses his powers to manipulate someone's brain in a way that he doesn't really need to he did that to blob right like that's a thing that happened he made blob forget everything mm -hmm. yeah. he does it to many of the early villains and Yikes. sometimes that's really the only way that they're going to get rid of the villain and to a certain extent i can understand that but he does it so often on people that he doesn't actually need to and at that point, it's just manipulation. You're not trying to save the world anymore. You're just trying to manipulate people. Also, like as a student, like surely it must occur to you as you're watching him do this yet again to somebody, how many times has he done this to me that I don't remember, right? Like that, that's, there's something of a Willow Terra kind of thing happening where it's mm -hmm. like, if you're willing to instrumentalize this so expediently, I have no way of knowing how stable my own existence is, right? Yeah. Well, and we also have this mythos in the comics now, again, continuity, where all of these characters have traveled into the future, come out of the closet, died, right. formed relationships, changed their powers, and all of that mental trauma is just buried in their brains. So it's, and, and Charles Xavier has seen these futures that are these possible futures that Mara has showed him uh, that we've learned in House of X. So they've, they've all got a lot going on under the surface when you add all the continuity in. Right, because by now they're back. Right? Mm -hmm. right yeah it all happened in x-men number eight they they leave and return in number eight Jeez. <laughs> that's part of the reason i set. that's the nice thing about having said it around 14 the the bobby flashback because one of the things that's in there is like it still means that bendis is coming out is the first one but um he's kind of still in that processing phase of it right where he can't quite articulate what it is that's bothering him mm -hmm. um, no it's brilliant and as usual xavier has been no help at all right like the world's most powerful telepath is also your teacher and yet this kid is left to struggle in the closet for 60 years <laughs> so... which is very likely why you had bobby coming out to magneto instead of charles. oh yeah why would you ever come out to charles xavier like charles xavier is the like if you think about it um and this is kind of implicit in that story Charles Xavier is the reason Bobby doesn't come out for so long because Charles Xavier ran a school where the guiding principle of its philosophy was you must hide who you are. We must blend in. Here are some straps for your wings. Here are some, some shoes for your feet. Uh, above all, we must prove to them that we are willing to comply and willing to blend in. And then people are like, well, why did Bobby take so long to come out? It's like, what else was he supposed to do? Was he taught anything like a pride? Was he taught anything about having being yourself in public no he he learned at charles xavier's feet how to closet yourself so of course magneto is the first person he would tell, come out to absolutely um brilliant and, i, I and love that's it so my much. take on it anyway <laughs> xavier is a jerk <laughs> it's why he's a cool character honestly um if he, we were meant to buy into this like benign paternalism this would be a much worse comic um, what's interesting in these early issues is to track how much the writers want us to be like, wait, what did he just do? Yeah. <laughs> it was Because it was if after, they didn't want us to, they're very bad at it, right? <laughs> it was after reading dozens of back issues to prepare for the trial episode. And then the two and a half hour trial at the end, I'm like, oh, I think I understand this character now. 
Yeah. Uh, but it took a lot of prep and a lot of discussion. Uh, Heather and Daryl, did you guys have favorite moments in the issue or favorite characters you wanted to mention? My favorite moment wasn't a specific moment. I loved the whole part where the Blob and Unis are making it seem like Cyclops is on their side because that just cracks me up like the whole time they're like oh yeah like you only did this to make it seem like you're not on our side but you knew that it wasn't going to hurt us or you know come and help us carry these bags of money like they don't let up and I love it <laughs> um I mean I don't love what it leads to obviously but it cracks me up whenever they're sitting there just trying to make it seem like he's with them um and then my star player would probably be Jean, because like I said earlier, when she gets to like step up and be the hero because none of the guys are there to stop her, I, I dig it. Fantastic. And Daryl, who is your star player? My star player is the woman with the umbrella. Mm. Because <laughs> she is the only one who is seeing through Beast right now, and it's wonderful. <laughs> um, and my favorite beats were the blueness moments. Um, blueness forever. Yeah. Because they brought a lot. Like Heather said, they were, it was Abbott and Costello level of uh, comedy where they're mm -hmm. like, hey, buddy, thanks for being here. Hey, come <laughs> on, help us out. Get this giant sack of money because a bank has just one sack and it has the money sign on it. I will and remind you all that, that Lucifer did show us his blueness. <laughs> oh, yours is colored differently than mine. Mine is yeah. bright red. We've commented on that a lot. My my reprint has different. I have a I have the the like the big bound volume, and it, it, mm. the coloring is is altered for people. Yeah, I it, wonder if is yours is the original or mine, because I wonder if that means that. I'm sorry, it's like I wonder if that means that someone looked at this and was like, maybe it shouldn't be a oh, huge yeah. red penis. Yours <laughs> yours looks even more engorged somehow. Yeah, engorged <laughs> is the right word. <laughs> yeah. Quite too messed is. is <laughs> We, uh, if we flip to the cover of X Men number twenty one, if you guys have it available, what are some of your preliminary thoughts on uh, on the cover itself? Um, sorry, just loading. Well, uh, we have Professor X who's strapped to his chair, still in his fishbowl. Yes, still in his fishbowl, so he's not being controlled, but he's still trapped with you know the blanket over his legs for modesty. Um, <laughs> And the rest Heather, of the oh, I, I was going to say, we, we get all four of the X-Men in like super amazing act, uh, action poses. And Heather, tell us what Jean's doing. <sighs> what is Jean always doing? Because she's being written by men. <laughs> she's basically ducking for cover. Everyone else is like fighting actively and she's crouched down, like shielding herself because what else is she going to do? She might be using her powers and we just can't see it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you keep thinking that, Chad. Keep that optimism in life. Has your uh, podcast talked about, um, there's a great uh, website, like a blog that keeps, that talks about the X-Men without words, where they- mm, I'm unfamiliar. The, oh, I'm not sure what it's, I would take a minute to Google it, but um, it's a, it's a, a blog that looks at the early Kirby art um, and because they're working in the, the Marvel method, right? So the art is drawn and then Stan Lee adds words to it, right? He's given a sketch of the script to Jack Kirby. Jack Kirby delivers art and then Stan Lee adds words. Um, and one of the things that the project has sort of recovered and sort of recoups in doing this is how often Kirby's art is depicting Jean, this is not a Kirby image, this cover, but um, Kirby's art depicts Jean being proactive and doing um, work that uh, is useful and how often Stanley's script will add in dialogue where, for example, Xavier will be giving her a telepathic command to do that thing, or Cyclops will be shouting like, Jean, do this, like even Actually, um, I was reading an earlier issue for the to prep for this. I think it's the first appearance of Lucifer, where Jean on the page is clearly putting down a plank to save her own step. But Iceman has, or Cyclops has now been given dialogue to uh, indicate he's giving her an order to do that. So um, 
even though obviously Jack Kirby is himself subject to his own kind of chauvinist <laughs> impulses, it is interesting to see how often Gene is diminished by the script itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brilliant. And I would love if you would uh, link me that. I'll uh, find website it. For and you, I'll post yeah. it. I'll post it for our fans. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, the, the other thing that stands out on the next cover is the giant green. We presume it's a robot. That's Dominus. We're going to learn more about him next time. Uh, but yeah, we'll be back for uh, X-Men 21 next time. It's called From Whence Comes Dominus because we get these Shakespearean phrases still or, or literature based. Uh, uh, what a pleasure to have each of you here and to, to intersect. Uh, I uh, The reason I keep doing this podcast is because I'm having so much fun. I'm meeting new people. We're nerding out about things that we love. We're talking about queer theory and continuity. Uh, I did look up earlier. I saved it for the end. So fun fact for today. Uh, boob tube. The, mm. the television sets back then were often called tubes because they were like, right. you know, yeah, that's what the things. Yeah, yeah, uh, with big antennas. And uh, it was coined, the phrase was coined uh, back in the 50s because they often thought of people who watched television as mm. boobs. So someone who was like oh, yeah. foolish or, or, or ridiculous. So it was the boob tube became the phrase. Um, I will add a footnote here so the the tumblr page i was talking about is called kirby without words okay um kirby without words dot tumblr dot com and even just on the panel i'm looking at right now it won't show up too well but for example there you can see in the panel without words medusa is sort of fighting with sue um and yet when stan lee adds script uh suddenly uh medusa or sue is given a command by reed to attack uh, Medusa, right? So it is a consistent quality of the art versus the script as finalized that men become the agents of female action. It's a really neat project to sort of, and like, again, like Stanley will have his detractors for the rest of history, but um, it is neat just to see how that sort of blithe action happens at a scripting level. Well, and Jean has basically only fought two women the whole series so far. She fought mm -hmm. the wasp who pulled her hair and then she has fought the Scarlet Witch and they're just jealous of each other. Uh, yeah. right. So it's it's fascinating commentary. Um, I uh, I had so much fun today, you guys. Thank you. Uh, Gray Malkin Lane can be found on uh, Twitter under Gray Malkin P, P for podcast, or under Instagram, just under Gray Malkin Lane. We're posting a lot of images from the original comics uh, as we review these. Uh, where can people find each of you online if you'd like to share? Uh, and a side question for Anthony, any upcoming work we should be looking out for? Oh, um, uh, well, you can find me online at Mia Koopa is my handle on most things. It's a terrible Latin and Super Mario pun, uh, <laughs> M-E-A-K-O-O-P-A, -O -O um, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, um, or anthonyolivera.com. Uh, upcoming work, you've caught me at a weird moment because some stuff has not been announced mm. yet. Uh, nothing for Marvel. If, if, if anybody wants me to do some Marvel work, I'd have to do it. Uh, <laughs> I have a book coming out in a few, well, God knows when you're listening to this, but uh, there's a graphic novel called Apocrypha, uh, which is about uh, queer teens versus the Christian apocalypse. Um, I have a novel uh, coming out called Day Spring, which is based on a short story I wrote. Um, a bunch not, of stuff, but if you follow me cable. on Twitter, you can see it all. What's that? Day, Day Spring is original and not about cable. Yes, although the cable reference, cable's reference is a Christian reference. So <laughs> there's a lot of weird crypto Christian stuff in the cable origin, the Ascani Sun stuff mm, and everything. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it does. It did. It did occur to me when we were naming that this will read as an X Men thing, and I kind of decided it would stay that way. <laughs> um, but anything I'm doing, I'll announce on Twitter. So that's the best way to find me. Okay. Uh, where can people find the other two of you? Daryl. Oh, sure. So uh, people can find me on Instagram. I am Mac on Fleetwood. So it's like Fleetwood Mac, but I switched it up. <laughs> so it's Mac on Fleetwood. I encourage anyone to reach out to me, follow me. I'll follow you back, um, have conversations about nerdy stuff or my pet bunnies that I post pictures of too. Cool. And then you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Heather underscore Beth underscore. And I've been posting a lot of selfies on Instagram because I'm doing a 52 hike challenge this year. And my Twitter 
God knows what I post on Twitter. So. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I, I have talked about this the last couple of weeks, but the documentary I've been working on for the last five years just came out on October 1st. So if you're interested, it is about a gay hate crime based in Utah. Uh, it is a compelling and difficult story, but something that's really powerful. You'll be glad you watched it. It's called Dog Valley and it's available through iTunes or Apple TV. Uh, so thank you to each of you for being here today. What an absolute pleasure and what an attractive bunch we are. It's so, <laughs> it's so nice to look at handsome faces. <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, you so much for having me oh it's been an absolute honor thank you for responding so uh we'll see you guys back next week on uh on gray malkin lane